Hi, I'm David. I'm the coordinator of the Maths Learning Centre. And um, this is a revision seminar for IFM in semester one, 2015. Okay. I've had some requests from people um, and I'm going to try and do um, as many of them as I can. And the request I had last night via email um, was to do closed Leontief models. Um, but it wouldn't be a bad idea to just talk about Leontief models generally. So um, for a Leontief, an open Leontief model, the idea is that you might have different pieces of a company or different pieces of an economy and then some outside body demanding um, some product is produced. And so your pieces of your company um, will produce certain outputs but they will require, um, out, they will require thing, the other pieces to produce outputs in order to, to produce that output. Um, and so, um, for example, the, print and the image and copy center here at the University of Adelaide, which produces printing, um, will require a certain amount of printing from itself in order to do its job because it will need to print flyers to advertise itself and blah, blah, blah. But it will also require um, input in the, in the form of um, actually USBs or, or emails to describe what it actually produces. And so it takes some inputs and it uses some of its own input to produce its own output. And so the amount of output that the, w that the one produces, um, some of it will go to number two, some of it will go to number three, and some of it will go to our external body. But the amount of output that two, that two, two produces, some of it uh, will go to number one, some of it will go to number three, Oh, some of the output from one goes back to one as well. Some of it will come back to where it started and some of it will go to the external provider, the external, um, not provider, the, ex the external body. And for three, um, it will use some of its own input, output. It will send some to number two it will send some to number one. And it will send some. Now, while that diagram that I have drawn there um, with the fat arrows looks a bit intimidating, the reason I drew it that way was to try and indicate that it's all a single amount of product that's produced here and it's split up later to be given to the others. So my one produced this amount of product and some of it came back to itself and some of it went to the other things. My two produced its product. And my three produced its in hopefully a different color. Okay, and this is my object that is demanding um, whatever's left over. So a certain amount of this stuff, it's all happening continuously, so a certain amount of this stuff is used up in order to produce the output that we're producing. So I'm going to need, number two needs these two inputs, this blue, yellow arrow and this green arrow coming into it, in order to produce this pink arrow that comes out. And number one needs this this yellow arrow and this um, this pink arrow and this green arrow in order to produce this yellow arrow that comes out. And the paradox is, of course, that some of this yellow arrow that comes out is fed back in. And so somehow we're actually simultaneously using some of the stuff that we produce to produce the stuff that we produce. Yes. Uh, and so because it's like a big economy and everything's happening simultaneously all the time, we can talk about it that way, even though logically if you did it in time order, you're going, where does this stuff come from? Um, it's all happening simultaneously. And so the way that we can do it is that we can list how much stuff each object, um, each um, area needs in order to produce a certain amount of stuff. And so we can say that number one needs some amount 
of its own and some amount of number two's product and some amount of number three's product and um, all of this will produce one of number one's product and then number two will have a similar list what will happen is that we can do this with matrices which is why it's in the algebra part of your course um, and so what this thing is, this column here becomes a column of your matrix. It becomes the first column of your matrix. So listing it as a column like this is actually very useful. Sweet. <laughs> I say this because I've already tried this seminar and, and I deleted the recording and I've started again. Okay. But what this doesn't do is it doesn't record the amount of leftover stuff. Okay, so what we're saying is that this is the amount I need to produce one of of um, to produce one of number one's product. Yes. So let's just see, this is the amount I need to produce one of number one's product. So it needs this amount of number one and this amount of number two and this amount of number three in order to produce a certain amount of number one, like that. And the same deal here, um, number two will need this amount of number one and this amount of number two and this amount of number three in order to produce a certain amount of number um, two. So if you think about it in the right way, when you multiply out a matrix, one of the ways of thinking about it, so you know that when you multiply a matrix you'll go this times this and this times this and this times this and you'll add them all together. But you can also think about it as saying, well, it'll be this times A and this times B and this times C as well and this times A and this times B and this times C as well. So I can actually think of it as the entire column times A and this entire column times B and this entire column times C. So I'm actually going to be able to go this whole column times A and this whole column times B and this whole column times C. This is the amount of stuff I need to make A this is the amount of stuff I need to make B, and this is the amount of stuff I need to make C. And so it adds up in total to the total amount of stuff that is needed. So, So this is a, a this is a vector, right? So it lists the amount of each of the products that I need to make A, the amount of each of the products I need to make B, the amount of each of the products I need to make C, and this will be the total amount needed to make A, B, C. Okay. Cool. I feel so much better now. So, when we look at one of these models, we go, okay, so the total amount that we actually need to produce these outwards coming arrows um, is this matrix times the amount of stuff that actually comes out in total. So we can say the total amount needed to produce X is A times X. But 
the total amount needed to produce X is all of these inwards facing arrows. So this bit of the green is needed to make two's product, this bit of the green is needed to make one's product, this bit of the green is needed to make three's product. And so all of those, all of these arrows that, that faff around in here, um, that's the AX, sorry. All of these arrows that faff around in this bit, that's the AX. And then there's still a little bit left of the X that we produced that ends up over here in D. So we've got the amount that we needed to make X plus the bit that was left over, which is the bit that goes to D. That adds up in total to the total amount that we actually produced. Okay. And that is where this matrix things come from. Now, you may not want to actually derive that every time you use it, and it might be useful to just chuck this formula on your cheat sheet, but that's where it comes from. This is the amount that we want to have left over to give to the thing that's demanding. This is the amount of stuff that's required to produce the result that we produced. And together, the amount that we need to make the result and the amount left over is the total amount that we made. Right. Awesome. So this is the stage where we do some nice little matrix algebra um, in order to figure out uh, what X has to be. Okay, so the concept is that, that our external um, body has asked us for a particular amount and it's asked us for the D and so we know what the D is um, and then we know what the A is because we know how much stuff we need to make what we can make. Um, and so we need to figure out the, the amount of stuff we're going to have to make overall in order to have enough left over to give to the, to the person demanding. And so we're going to get, <coughs> we can use some matrix algebra to, pardon me, to do this. I'm just going to make sure I've got it around the right way. Right, so what I'm going to do um, is I'm going to move the AX over to the other side. So in this equation, I had AX plus D equals X. I want to subtract the AX from both sides, which would mean that if I subtract it from here, it disappears. And if I subtract it from here, it ends up there. And then They've both got an X, so I'd like to factorize it out. Um, but I can't technically factorize it out at the moment. If they were just numbers, I'd leave a 1 behind. Um, so I'm just going to need to do a nice little matrix trick to say, well, I times anything is the same. Okay, I can stick an I in wherever I want, because that's how matrices work. I is the same as 1 um, for matrices, as it is um, I for matrices is the same as 1 for numbers. And so D is equal to I minus AX. And so that means that if I multiply both sides by the inverse of whatever I minus A is, it will produce X by itself. So I want to, div you know, in inverted commas, divide by that, but I can't divide by matrices, so I multiply by the inverse. Like that. And so if I write that around the right way, X... I want. Alternatively, you could, if you didn't want to actually do the inverse, you could just solve it like you would with a, with a, a matrix equation thing. Okay, so you could instead, instead of multiplying by the inverse, because if you happen not to know the inverse, um, you could instead just create a matrix that had I minus A and D here, a nice augmented matrix, and do row operations. You do row operations in this course, don't you? Yeah. And this here will tell you what X is. Sorry. 
So you do the raw operations and you'll get to the identity here and then this will be what the answer for x is. So um, you can either, so you've got two options. Option number one is to multiply by the inverse and option number two um, is to do the raw operations. So technically if you're in your exam, it is actually okay to skip straight to here. <coughs> you don't technically have to do all this working that shows how you get there if you don't want to. Um, but if it makes him feel more comfortable when you're in the exam, go for it. Right. So that's your closed one, which is sweet. I mean, you just have all the numbers and you'll chuck them in and it'll turn out to whatever it turns out to. Your open model is very similar, except there's no D. So, sorry, your closed model is very similar, except it doesn't have the D. Everything just goes to itself. So there is no D. already did that. Oops. I know this is probably a waste of everybody's time for me to draw these fancy pictures, but I feel better about them. So for the closed one, there is no D. It all just um, goes to itself. So the amount of product that comes out of one ends up back at one. Some of it ends up in product in number two. Some of it ends up in number three. The amount that comes out of two, some of it ends up in two. Some of it ends up in one. Some of it ends up in three and the amount that comes out of three, some of it ends up in three, some of it ends up in two, and some of it ends up in one. And the idea is that the total amount coming in is equal to the total amount coming out. So these three here, this amount coming out, these three, this, this, this is used to create that bit coming out. So in your closed um, model, you'll say, well, the total amount I need in order to produce the amount that I produce, it just happens to be equal to the amount that I actually produce. So the total amount that you need to make what you make is the same as actually what you make. So you use everything up to make the next set of things that you make and then you use them everything up to make the next set. So really it's the same as the other one but there is no D. This D here is zero. Nobody demands anything external so we don't have it there. Now the problem with that is that there is this um, thing. We could do exactly the same trick but we're going to have an issue that there's not going to be an inverse anymore. Also, what we are going to do is we're going to say, well, just a second, since everything goes back to itself anyway, we might as well just write everything in terms of percentages. So instead of saying um, to produce one of X, we're going to need one of these and two of these and three of these, we're going to say well, to produce one of these, we're going to need, we're going to use up, to produce 100% of the X of, of number one, we're going to use this percent of number one, this percent of number two, and this percent of number three. So. Since you never have leftover, we 
do it as percentages. So the idea is we can say, Number one needs this sort of percent of its own, this percent of number twos, this percent of number threes, to produce 100%, something like that. Pretty sure that's about right. See, that doesn't make any sense that they should add up to 100% then, which is the bit that really bothers me. Shouldn't the rows add up to 100% then? No. <laughs> Have I done that the wrong way around then? Um, Okay. So why do the columns have to add up to one? Dividing by xi inputs of each sector equals its outputs. So when I go back to this equation here, oh, this is equal to a again like this is equal to ABC. So this this is the input for A to produce um, this is the this is the arrow that goes into A, right? So this is the arrow that goes into number one here and there's another one. This arrow is the one that goes into number one. This arrow is the number one that goes into number one. Those three arrows there all have to um, be used to produce the output from number one. Um, and so apparently they have to add up to number one. Yes. So A times this and B times this. Okay, I'm going to leave that for the moment and not stress about it, but they do definitely have to add up um, to one because that, um, yes, that makes sense. They add up to So I guess what we're saying is that all the outputs are sort of standardised to the same size. So if we take a, a certain percentage of each of them, they go, well, we're just going to add them all up and it's going to produce the output of the other one. Okay, they're all just going to add up to 100%. I'm going to leave that like that. Okay, cool. I'm going to leave it at that. But then by the same reasoning for the other thing, we've got that AX equals X. Zero equals X minus AX. But 
but the fact that there is actually solutions says that I, I minus A isn't invertible, so we're actually going to just have to do it by the, um, by the augmented matrix method. So we'll put zero there and we'll do row operations. But what's going to happen is you're going to get a free variable. So let's do a proper example. You're going to get a free variable. So let's just do that example in the in the lecture um, in the exam. So this is 2014. Algebra um, question four. Just so that if anyone's got the exam, they can go looking for it. So. So you started with that, and you know that the columns all have to add up to 1, 100%, uh, which is 1 because we're writing them all as decimals. So this must be 0.2, this must be 0, and this must be 0.6 in order for them all to add up to 100%. So you've got 80% and 20%. You've got 100% already. Um, so 60 and 40 is 100, 20%, 20%, and 40%, and there's 60% left over. So what is the required production of each sector in order for this economy to actually work the way we've described it? Uh, we're going to need to do I minus A X equals zero. So let's figure out I minus A. So we have minus zero point. So I'm just going to fill in all the off diagonal ones. Minus point six, minus point two, minus point two, minus zero is zero, minus point two, minus zero is zero. So they're all the off diagonal ones because I just minus them and then I go 1 minus the diagonal. So 1 minus 0.8 is 0 0.2, 1 minus 0.4 is 0 0.6, 1 minus 0 0.6 is 0 0.4. So I tend to do all the minuses and then I do the diagonal. You can do it the other way around. And I want to row reduce this equal to 0. Oh, okay. Well, I know I can I can make a zero here by doing row one, uh, row three plus row t one. My new row three is row three plus row one, and I might just times everything by ten if you don't mind, because then I'll get rid of all my decimal places. So two minus six. Two, zero, six, two, minus two. And then when I add them together, I'll get zero, zero, two, like that. Um, and then I could divide everything by two, because that would just make my life easier as well. Um, It looks like if I do my row operations right, I should be able to clear that column above um, because I can do... Have I done something wrong? So I times everything by 10. 2 minus 6 minus 2. 0, 6, 2. So that was zero, zero, two. Is there not a zero somewhere that I'm supposed to have? Oh crap, yes, you're right. Minus zero point six. 
So that was probably a bad plan to do that one, but anyway. <laughs> Thank you. I went this plus this, this plus this is minus point is minus six. Yeah. Okay. The world makes sense again. And then if I add this one onto both of them, I'll be able to clear um, everything like that. Like that. Cool. Feeling better. Um, and so normally what you do at that point um, is start putting in three variables. I mean, traditionally you put a one in this spot. Um, when you do row operations, you, you aim for uh, ones coming down the diagonal, but you could conceivably put it anywhere if you wanted. Um, yeah. So what, normally what you're supposed to do is make for identity matrix columns. So that's why I cleared this one first. Um, and then I cleared these. You're supposed to divide by two here. Uh, sorry, divide by three here to produce the third in that spot. And I might do that just um, to... to get it to where I want it to be. That is my final reduced row echelon form. And so I've got a pivot here and a pivot here and that makes this one a free variable. And so I will let the third one be t. Then according to this, x1 minus 2t is 0, so x1 is 2t. And x2 is a third of t. So what will happen when you do this sort of thing is you'll get x3 equals t and then these two will move over there um, and change signs as they do so because it's like an equation. It's like an equals here. And so I've got that x1, x2, x3 is actually t, 2t, a third of t, like that. Um, and what I need to do is choose t so that everything adds up to 1, basically. That's my goal. Because I just need to choose a t. Because everything's supposed to add up to 1, um, because it's 100% of the, the whole. Actually, no, we just leave it as it is. Just multiply by t. That's OK. That's, a co that's next semester. <laughs> um, so just to make it easier on myself, I could technically multiply everything by 3 and it would look, look prettier if I wanted. So this would be the same as just having like that. This is equivalent to as opposed to equal to. Um, because I can choose whatever t I want, I can just as easily just multiply everything by 3 and it's okay because now it's all whole numbers and, and my life makes more sense. Is that what you got? Yes. <laughs> and so then the final, and so that's my um, production. So any multiple of that will do. So if I produce three um, in, pro in um, if I produce three in um, industry one and six in industry two and one in industry three, that'll work. Or if I produce um, one, two, and a third, that'll work as well, and any multiple of that will be fine. So that means that we still need one more bit of information to actually figure out how much production is going on around here. And then in question C it says, if the first sector's production is 600, what's the production of the second and third? Um, and so we're saying that this one here is 600. which means that t must be 200 and so therefore the production is 3 times 200 is 600, 6 times 200 is 1200 and t 200 is 200. Like that. 
That could technically tell you any one of the sectors and you could figure out what the other one was, other ones were. And that's closed models. Right. Cool. Making, it's all working quite well. So, um, that's that. And I will take that out and start something else. Because where are we up to? Uh, yeah, okay. So, you guys um, wanted to talk about whether to convert interest rates or not with some sort of annuities and, and interest rates and stuff. Okay. Did you find an example yet when you were looking around? So this isn't about like converting to an equivalent rate, is it? Is it? it? It's not about like we've got something compounded, compounded semi-annually. What is that? Annually? Okay. Um. Okay. So you've got all these problems, and then and things are compounded. Um, in certain time periods. Um, you need an interest rate per time period for any of this stuff to work, as far as I know. Um, that's the idea. Um, so, As far as I know, you're always supposed to convert. The issue is that if you're told it per time period to begin with, don't convert. So if you're already told what the interest rate is per month, you don't want to convert it to per annum already. That's the only time I can think of when it would be a problem. Unless it compounds at a different time period than it um, pays. I mean, that time period would be um, time periods in which payments happen or in which interest is compounded. So. So you need to pay attention to when payments happen and when interest is compounded. So if it's an annuity, payments will happen at certain spots. And when interest is compounded, will happen at certain spots. I can't think of, I've, I've got an idea in my head, but I don't know if it's the sort of question you've been asked in this course. Um, but uh, you can imagine that um, interest might be calculated monthly, but only actually added yearly, in which case, there'll be some interesting things going on there. Um, yeah. But I don't think there's any like that in your actual course that I recall. Uh, this is the wrong part of the exam for um, looking for questions like that. Okay, I'm sorry, I can't, don't understand quite enough to be able to 
make a difference to that question. Um, in general, you will have to divide. So if it says something like, uh, um, Fifteen hundred invested at three percent per annum <coughs> compounded monthly. Um, then the key is to focus on when the interest is compounded. Um, it's compounded monthly, so I'm going to need to divide by twelve to get it into a monthly because it's currently yearly. So I'm going to have to go. Um, the final amount will be the original amount times 1 plus for two years and this would be 24 months. So you'll have to convert your per annum into months by dividing by 12 and convert your two years into months by times in by 12. Is that, that's what you would normally do? Yeah, and that's just that's just the ordinary compound interest formula, and it should work like that for annuities as well. But in annuities, all your annuity formulas, when it has an I there, that's a per period interest rate. Okay, so I think I've, I might have it. Sorry, real and nominal interest. That's what you want to talk about. Yeah, yeah. I will. Just, I just that's good to say, but. So converting just let me look that up. Right. So um the um The annual interest rate where you say it's like in this one, this is a 3% per annum compounded monthly, this is called the nominal interest rate because it's the amount that's actually listed on the piece of paper. It's the named interest rate, that's what nominal means. So this 3% per annum is the nominal interest rate. Nominal means name, to do with names. It's the one that has been named in the in the um, investment policy. Um, but it's if you actually did put something in at three percent per annum compounded annually, you won't get the same amount because you're compounding more often. So we're going to say, well, what would the interest interest rate have to be to get the same amount if we had compounded it annually instead? So, just do it as an example. Nominal 3% per annum compounded monthly. The effective annual rate, so the real interest rate, So the effective interest rate is the interest rate that you would have if it really was compounded yearly. Okay? So it doesn't matter how long it's done for um, because it'll all just add up in the same way. So we know that, let's call it I, the effective interest rate I. So we know if we started with some principle and we compounded it at an interest rate of I for one year, Right? That's a yearly interest rate, I over 1. It should come out to the same answer as the principal with my 3% over 12 for 12 months. So this is how much I would get if I compounded at 3% per annum compounded monthly for 12 months. This is how much I would get at an interest rate of I compounded annually 
for one year. How does that? How do you feel about that? Yep. And so you rearrange that to figure out what um, the I is. So the P's will cancel. So technically you don't need them at all because they've both got a P. I'm dividing them both by P. And then you'll be able to subtract one from both sides. So you'll be able to get I equals. And that is the effective interest rate. So that's converting, converting an effective interest, a nominal interest rate at a certain amount of compounding to an effective interest rate. It should be possible to convert the other way as well um, by the same reasoning. Personally, I have trouble remembering formulas, so I, I would do this every time. So I do have to divide this one by 12 when converting to the effective interest rate. Is that, is that what was came up when you were doing it? That was a problem? I, I have a feeling that you only use it when you're asked to. So unless you specifically need to figure out the effective interest rate because someone asked you to, I don't think you need to. Um, I, the only situation I can possibly think of where it was necessary to do so would be if it was um, if payments in a annuity happened at a different time period than the than the interest rate was compounded. So if it was compounded at three percent per annum, but the payments were happening monthly, you might want to convert your monthly your your per annum into a monthly. But I think it would still all work anyway, so I don't think it matters. I think it will be fine. So, basically, yep. <laughs> don't convert unless asked to. I'm pretty sure um, that that's the deal. But it's good to have the formula. I can never remember that formula. I have to do it from scratch every time. And so if you wanted to, just in case you, you got to this point, if you wanted to convert um, from something that was 3% compounded monthly to what, um, to what would be the equivalent rate compounded, <coughs> say, um, semi-annually, um, you can do the same thing. You can convert from one compounding to another um, in the interest rates. So e.g. So 3% compounded monthly is what percent per annum compounded semi-annually? Um, you could do the same trick, but instead of this one being annually, you could do it semi-annually. So you could actually go that, well, my principal times 1 plus the missing interest rate semi-annually, so twice per year, and um, there's two payments in a year, is 1 plus 0 0.03 over 12 to the 12. Um, and then you would solve that equation. So you divide by the p's, then you'd square root both sides. And then you'd subtract one and then you'd times by two and that would be the answer. So you would do your algebra until you got to the answer that you wanted. Um, it's worth pointing out that if this was a 3, you don't have to write it as a root. You can do it as etc. You can actually note that if you do a half power on this side, it will do the 2, it'll cancel out the power of 2, so you get a half power on this side. And so you can actually just fraction um, what was there. So um, if it was 3 times, e 4 times a year, and this was a 4, you just divide both of the powers by four and it would all work out fine. So you could do it this way or and just 
technically what you're doing is you're raising both to the power of a half. Like that. And when you do powers of powers, they multiply. So 2 times a half is 1. And 12 times a half is 6. Like that. And so that would do the trick as well. And then you'd finish it off. So ion 2 equals... ..2 times all of that crap. So that's converting interest rates from one um, amount of compounding to another. So you've got these equivalent interest rates. Of course, you could, if you had two of them that were compounded at different rates, usually you'd convert them both to, a, to a, an annual effective rate and then you can compare them to see which one's better. All right, cool. How are we doing? So... Uh, someone mentioned logs. That was you. Wasn't it? Uh, the main point of talking about logs in this course is to allow you to solve equations that have exponentials in them. Um, as far as I can tell. So um, logarithms go with powers, uh, and so uh, it, um, there's a lot of powers when you do compound interest, which is one of the reasons why logs have appeared in this course. So when you do a power, so for example, one point, you know, O3 to the power of 15, for example, um, it will produce a particular answer. So I don't know what that is. I'm going to ask a computer because I would like to have a proper answer. There you go. Enough decimal places to keep everybody happy. Um, 1.03 to the power of 15 is that. So that's basically saying if you had 3% per annum, it was compounded once a year. Um, then you'd end up at the end of end of 15 years having roughly 55.796% extra on top of what you had to begin with because this is 155%. Okay? So that's what that's saying. 103%, 15 years in a row, it adds up to an extra to on top of what you begin with 156-ish percent. Okay. So that's the idea of powers and the reason why powers are in this course is because of compound interest of, of having to do that 103% and then another 103% uh, and then another times 103% and you just keep going. Logs are designed to do the opposite. It's designed to say, because what we did here is we said 103% to the 15 equals what? That's what we asked ourselves. Um, logs are designed to ask what goes in this spot here. So if I ask this question, What goes here to make it come out to, say, 80% extra? If I wanted to know how many years would I have to leave it in there to get up to an extra 80% on top of what I put in? That's the question that I would really be, I'm very interested in asking myself because I want to know, well, 15 years is quite a long time, but maybe, maybe I could do it for a little longer and I'd get a bit more. So logs are designed to answer this question here. Okay, and the answer to this question, the name of the answer to this question is that. So that is the name of that answer there. So it's saying the answer to 103 to the what is, is 1.80 is called, in, in math world, the name of that answer is log 1.03, 1.80. It's asking me, what power do I have to raise 1.03 to to get 1.80? That is the, the purpose of logs. 
And as such, I mean, it, the thing is, I, I don't know what that answer is, but I could conceivably ask a computer what that answer was. Okay, in Microsoft Excel, in Microsoft Excel, I could go log uh, of 1.8 with the base of 1.03. So in Microsoft Excel, you have to write them backwards. That's just the way it's done. And this is telling me that the answer is apparently 19.8853. Okay, so if I ask a computer for what that is, so what that means is, if I actually did 1.03 to the power of 19.8853, it would come out to 1.8. That's the goal of doing a log. If I ask my computer or whatever machine I have to calculate logs, um, whatever machine I have to calculate logs, if I ask it what that number is and then I do 1.03 to that power, it will come to the answer I was hoping for. That's the purpose of logs. So this comes out to that. So 1.03 to the 19.8853 will come out to exactly the answer 1.80. Okay, that's the whole point of logs. Now, normally when you're introduced to logs, you introduce them and everything's whole numbers. But really, the whole purpose of them is to deal with exactly this sort of situation. Okay. I will do some examples with whole numbers because I don't want to keep having to write horrifying decimals all the time. But that's the idea of logs. So, right. But any time when a mathematician creates a notation, like log whatever, whatever, um, in the same way that when we create the notation of plus or times, you can figure out the rules for manipulating what you write on the page so that if you rearrange it a bit, you'll get the same answer but by an easier approach. Okay, so having the rules for how logs work yep. having the rules for how logs work allows us to manipulate things on the page so that hopefully, even if we don't know what it is at the moment, we could just rewrite it and go, oh, well, I know what that answer is now. In the same way that when you do algebra, you can go, well, I've got these x's and I move them around and, oh, look, x is 4. Okay, that's what I'm going to be able to do, to use algebra on logs to figure out the answer. Okay. So, um, this logarithm thing, even though it's defined by this really insane process, and you say, ask this question and the answer is named this, there are some rules for how to manipulate it. Even if you don't know what the answer is, you can manipulate it on the page. Same as if even if you don't know what x is, you can times it by 4 and times it by x and get x squared. Okay, so even if we don't know what this number is, we can fiddle with it with, when we put it in formulas with other things. So these are our rules. The first rule is just the definition again. If I have any number and I do it to the power of log a any other number, it'll come out to b. Because that's the point. The point is that log a of b answers the question of what do you have to put in this spot to produce the answer b? And so the name of the thing you put in that spot is log AB. All right? So the I, what most people say it in their minds is, is A to the power of cancels out log base A. So if I go this A the power of and log A, they'll cancel each other out and leave a B behind. In the same way as timesing by 2 cancelling cancels out dividing by 2, A to the power of cancels out log A. And the other rule is that it works the other way around as well. So if you do it the other way around and you do log A and A to the B, it'll come out to B as well. So they cancel each other out. So what that means is that I'm actually able to solve... Well, it doesn't mean anything, actually. If I've got Excel handy, and Excel can do any log whatsoever, I'm now able to solve equations using logs if I want to. Okay, so um, as an example, I could go, um, let's see.
2 to the x equals 15. What does x have to be to make 2 to the x equals 15? Um, x is technically log 2 15. That's, the, that's what it means. Okay, but most people have trouble going straight to that point. So what most people have to do is they have to say, well, just a second, I know that log 2 cancels out 2 to the power of x, so I will go, I will do log 2 to both of these, and the log 2 and the 2 to the x cancel each other out. Now that's really two steps. You don't need that intermediate step. You're allowed to just say, well, the answer to what goes in this spot is log 215. That's what log 215 means. But most people struggle with that because it requires them to say this mantra in their head that's like 15 seconds long. And they have to go, so the answer to this question is log 215. Right, it's much easier to be able to write this down. <laughs> okay. And so we can ask a computer what log 2 of 15 is. Apparently 3.90689. Sweet. Um, if you're extremely lucky to have a number that happens to be a power that you happen to know, then you can, you can do this trick as well. Log 3 of 9. Okay, you know, if I had a computer handy that had a log 3 um, thing, like in, like in Excel, I could ask it. Um, but I, you know, what if I didn't? If I was really lucky, I could try and figure out what 9 is as 3 to the power of something. So 9 happens to be 3 squared. And log 3 and the 3 to the power of cancel each other out, so it comes out to 2. Okay, so that's the other method. So one of them is... You know, I have to get a computer to tell me the answer. And this one, it just, just so happens randomly, um, well, randomly set up precisely because the lecturer set it up that way, that 9 happens to already be a power of 3 that I happen to know. If you're not sure, if you see things with whole numbers like this, really, usually the only way of dealing with it is to guess that this thing here is a power of 3, so you can just start multiplying 3's to see how many it takes to get to the 9. And then that tells you what the log 3 is. So I could have actually gone, gone in my head, I could have gone, okay, start at 1, times 3, I'm at 3, times 3, I'm at 9, cool, so 9 is 3 squared. So you work your way up, or divide. But you know, you just keep timesing by the base until you get to the top. And I really, I mean, that's the other way of thinking about what logs are. Um, you could actually think about logs as saying, if I start at 1 and multiply by the base, it's how many times I have to do that until I get to the number I want. So if you look at this one back here, if I did um, log 2 of 15, let's see, we start at 1 and we times 2 and that gives me 2 and we times 2 and that gives me 4 and we times 2 and that gives me 8 and we times 2 and that gives me 16. So I know that um, to get to 16, I need four twos multiplied together. So this is telling me 2 to the 4 is 16. So log 2 of 16 is 4. So we can go the number of twos that you had to do to get this is log 2 of 16, which is 4. So since 15 is just a bit less than that, I would expect log 2 of 15 to be just a bit less than 4, which it is, it's 3.9. But it's not in a whole number because log, log, because log 2 of 8 is 3. So I know that when I got to 3 twos, I was at 8. When I got to 4 twos, I was at 16. So log 2 of 15 must be somewhere between 3 and 4. And it's got to be closer to... 4 than 3 because 15 is closer to 16 than it is to 4, to, to 8. So that's the other way of thinking about what logs are doing. But most people find it easier to just remember these rules. Okay, so they're my rule number one, really. That's the definition. Uh, there are some other really useful rules, which is how to manipulate the, the algebra. So the other rules are doesn't matter what the log is.
So, rule number one is that you can't expand out plus. It doesn't do anything. You cannot expand that out. Okay? Okay? It's rule number one. Okay? Your only hope is to figure out what B plus C is and then do log A of, B of the answer. Oh crap, other way around. Sorry, you can't expand that out. No, you can't. It's okay. B times C on the inside of a log will become... on the outside. So times on the inside is plus on the outside. So this log A has transferred itself to both the B and the C and has arranged a plus between it. And divide on the inside will become subtract on the outside. And powers on the inside becomes multiplication on the outside. Like that. So they're the, sort of the fundamental log laws. I remember it like this. You've got plus and minus at the bottom. And you've got times and divide one level higher. Because when you first learned multiplication, you thought, well, 2 times 3 is 2 lots of, is two lots of 3. So it's 3 plus 3. So when you first learned multiplication, you knew that you could create a multiplication by doing a whole lot of addition all at once. And powers are at the next level up uh, um, on top of times because you know that 2 to the power of 4 is 1 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2, 4 times. Okay, so powers is a whole lot of multiplication. So this is the layer, and it's the same order that you do the order of operations when you do algebra. I mean, obviously above that is brackets. So with the, with the order of operations with algebra, you have brackets, powers, times and divide, addition and subtraction, which most people have bed mass or something like that. Okay, so this is the same order. And what your logs do is logs turn powers into multiplication. Powers on the inside is multiplication on the outside. And they turn multiplication into addition and division into subtraction. And that's how I remember what they do. Um, powers, um, A to the power of something works in the opposite direction because it's the opposite. So um, plus inside um, the power will be multiplication on the outside. So this is sort of inside becomes this on the outside. So that's how I remember that. So they're the algebra rules of logs. And there are just a couple more useful rules. Log anything of 1 is always 0. Because that's that starting point. You always start at 1 when you're multiplying. and go 1 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2. I'm not necessarily putting them in the most ra rational order. I'm just thinking them as I go. And the last law, which is super duper useful, that they may or may not have taught you, but is still true and you're allowed to use, is if you have log AB, you can convert it to, into any other log. Okay, Any log can be converted into any other log. And it doesn't matter what log you use, you can use any log you like and it'll always come to the same answer. So log AB is log C of B divided by log C of A. I'm going to give you a specific example of this in just a moment. What this rule allows me to do um, is to actually not care about any logs whatsoever except the ones that I want. So your calculator doesn't have a log 2 button. It's only got a log 10. Okay, when, when you see log on the calculator, it means log 10. Not that's what it means. Um, it doesn't have a log 2 button. You go, well, what of all these times? I need to figure out what log 2 is. Well, that's OK, because you can figure it out. And your calculator actually has another logarithm, which is called ln.
LNA is log base E, where E is that like 2.7 something, 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 something. E is the number that you use in your continuous compounding formula. Okay, the same number as you use in continuous compounding. That is the number E. And so what that means is that all of these rules work perfectly well for LN as well. So that means that LN of E to the A is A, E to the LN of A is A. So E and LN cancel each other out. And it also means that we can now do our chains of base law in terms of LN. So no, this is not an I, it's an L. It's a small L. Um, so uh, maple TA, um, be very, yeah. Some people when they first use maple TA put a capital I N um, and it doesn't accept it because it's looking for a small L even though in, in, on the screen it looks the same. Uh, so that's a small L. Um, yes, so let me show you on the screen This was um, this one uh, was log base two of fifteen. So that should be the same as ln fifteen divided by ln at two, which it is. Yay! Excel has been set up to use this formula, probably. Yeah. At, at least Microsoft Excel confirms it, but that's a little bit like using um, using a in over in physics using an ohm meter to check ohm's law because ohm meter is built using ohm's law so that it can only confirm ohm's law but uh, yes microsoft excel is built using that law so it can only confirm that law but at least we believe it right because the computer told me so so um ln 15 over ln 2 is the same as log 2 of 15 and that allows us to me to convert any log to any other log which means it allows me to solve equations that have unknowns in the powers which is the whole point of knowing about logs. Um, well, later on, you will learn that logarithms actually have some other useful properties, um, and you'll often find that um, when you do statistics, um, they'll say um, when you do a regression with an LN in it, it refers to percentage change, and that's just one of the fabulous other properties of LN um, that it has. But um, as an example, Okay, whoa, sorry. As an example, we'll solve that one. The same one that we solved before using our computer to do log base 1.03 of 1.80. I don't need logs to do that anymore because I can use the power of um, ln. So I could rewrite it, I've got two options. Um, option one, um, is to rewrite it as well. This would have to be log base 1.03 of 1.8 because that's the definition of what log means. But instead, I can use my algebra rules of logs. So I can now say, let's do ln on everything here. So I'll take the 1.03 to the x and I'll take the 1.80 and I'll do ln to both of them. And one of the algebra rules of logs was that powers come down out of the log. So I actually have in my head an imagination that this comes down here. Like that. Powers come down out of the log. So the C came out the front. So that is the most useful law of logs. Powers come down out of the log which means that this x can come down out of the log because ln is a log. The x came down out of the log and now I have x times this number. I don't know what that number is. Something close to zero, right? Because ln of one would log of any one is always zero. Um, so it's like zero point something. Um, 
all I need to do now is to go, well, just a second, if this was just a, a number like 4, I'd divide by it to make it go away. Because x times 4 is that, so I had to divide by 4. So if I divide both sides by that, so divide this side by the ln 1.03 and it'll go away, and divide this side by the ln 1.03 and it will um, be there, and then I ask my computer or calculator what that is because my calculator has an LN button. Yep? What's that, sorry? Solve for T. Solve for T. Yep. Yeah. So let me just do an example of that, hey? I will just calculate what was the answer to that in the end. Um, 19. Okay, so you're saying that you want something where you've got like um, Something like that, 1,500 at 13% per annum compounded semi-annually, how long to double? That sort of question. Yep. And so we'll put in all our, our, our numbers with the missing letter missing. And so we know that we've got 1,500, 1 point, one, no, we'll have to do it the long way, 1 plus 0 0.13 semi-annually and two times the number of years. So, so you could put a T there for the number of years if you wanted. Um, okay, where we just should say to our reader, T is the number of years. Because we'd have to times it by two to get the number of six month periods. And this is supposed to come out to twice what it was before. Yep. Okay. Um, note that even if they didn't tell you what the amount was, you could still do it because if this was, say, if they just didn't tell you what the amount was, some amount is done at 13% per annum, how long does it take to double? You would just say P and this will be 2P. And then the P's will cancel and it'll all work anyway. Okay. So if you're going to solve something that's more complicated than an ordinary log equation, what you want to do is um, you want to look at where the T is and you want to go as far away from that as possible and, and deal with that first. So the T is in this power and then we times by the 1500, so we'll divide by the 1500 first before we do anything else. Okay, because we can do that. Whoop, too many zeros. So that's where we are now. And then now we're, we need to deal with the fact that this is in a power, so we'll do LN on both sides. Like that. And the 2T, because it's in a power, will come down. I'm sure I could figure out what that is, but I just can't be bothered. And then I want the T by itself, so I'm going to have to divide by the 2 and the LN whatever to make them both go away. Like that. Because the 2 and the LN stuff were both attached to the T, so I had to divide them both. And then whatever this works out to be is what T is. Let's see. Um, so we have ln2 divided by ln1 plus 0 0.13. T2. 
So that's what I get out of my computer. So technically, I'm going to have to do it for um, 11 years and another six-month period if I want to get properly over the 30,000, uh, the, the 3,000 mark. Because this is saying it's going to take me just over 11 years. So I'm going to have to have 11 years and one more period before I can actually be strictly over the 30,000, the 3,000 mark. Um, so it depends on what they're, you know, 11 years and one more compound. So one of the ways that people deal with this is instead of putting 2 times t here, they just put t for the number of periods. So you say that's the number of compound periods and you'll say it's 11 years and another 6 months. Yeah, so I could have just put the T there without the 2 and then it would have come out as 22, which is 22 half years. Yeah, but you always have to put the divide by 2 at this stage. That's important. All right. So yeah, if I was actually going to do it monthly, so mg... What if monthly I have I might just put a number of months there instead of having the number of years and just go that's the raw number of months. So I don't need to times it by 12 or anything because it's already in months. And that's one of those situations where you're not going to do the, the normal thing you do. So you could just say where M is just the raw number of months. because then it'll give your answer in months, which actually means a lot more because it compounds every month and so it's useful for you to know which month to pull it out in. So you do the same trick. And then the M will come down. I already had a bracket. I've been writing for quite some time off the screen, sorry about that. Like that, and that will come out as whatever it comes out to. Oh crap. I think I forgot the 2 when I did the previous calculation. Yes, I did. Sorry. Okay, sorry about that. The other one was actually, I forgot the 2. So, right. Okay, so now um, this one will be in months. And it was um, sixty-four points. So that's what I get months. So I'm going to have to wait till the sixty-fifth month to 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 properly get over the three thousand mark. Because if I because sixty sixty-four. It's 64 and a third months, right? So I'm not going to, since it only happens every month, I'm going to have to wait till the next month. So um, need 65 months to get over the $3,000 mark. Yeah. Oh, crap. Um, and continuous compounding is a whole different story um, because it, has an e to the whatever, um, but you still use an ln to solve that one. It's just actually easier. So I'll do that one too. What if continuous? Well, in that case, we'll get 1500 e to the r t. That's right, isn't it? P E R T, yeah. Um, equals 3000. And we'll divide both sides by the 1500. 
And now we do LN on both sides. And LN and E to the power of cancel each other out. And so T is LN T like that. Ln two divided by zero point one k. Because my t was in years, and that one you can leave as a decimal because it's continuous compounding. You can take it out whenever you want because it's continuous. So you can take it out halfway through a day, and it will be fine. Yeah, and you'll see that. This actually, with the continuous compounding, that is the minimum possible amount of time it could possibly take, no matter how often you compounded it. Okay, so if you compounded it, like continuous compounding is the most often you can possibly compound, theoretically, um, and so it can't possibly take any less than 5.33 years. And the, the less often you compound it, the longer it will take. And that's one of the reasons we have con continuous compounding, if someone said to if, if someone you as a financial advisor said to you, oh well, you know, what if I compounded it more often? You go, just I'll do the continuous one and this will give you the absolute worst case scenario. You definitely have to wait for five and a third years, no matter what you do. So that's the idea behind continuous compounding. Um, it allows you to say this is my worst case scenario for the amount of you know, or my best case scenario for the amount of interest I'll get. Do you feel a bit better about your logs? Hopefully. <laughs> yeah. I might have to stop there because it's already quarter past three. Um, the last thing I was supposed to talk about was deferred annuities. You know, we'll see how it goes. 15 minutes, okay. Give myself 15 minutes. Okay. Um, so it's really the present value of an annuity we're normally interested in, isn't it? Like you get told that you're going to get, you're going to get a payment of whatever, however often, starting at whenever, and you want to know the present value of the annuity. That's often what the problems are of the flavour, right? I'm pretty sure that's how it normally goes. I'm just going to do an example that's from the lecture notes. So, okay, so a life insurance policy is valued at $15,000 now. The beneficiary will receive 120 monthly payments. Except that's EI, right? Interest on this policy is paid at 7% per annum compounded monthly. Okay. Determine the value of the regular payments if the first payment is made in a month's time. I'll do a year. Okay, so this is our problem. I've got this annuity, it's valued at $150,000 now. It's going to be 120 monthly payments. 
7% per annum compounded monthly. Find the value of the payments if the first payment is made in a year's time. Okay, so I always like to draw a picture of my annuity. This is time. This is time. Um, I do know that the present value is $150,000 now. So, um, that's my present value, because that's what it's valued at. There is a formula for how present value is related to regular payments, but I'm just going to see if I can figure it out and see if I can make, make um, sense of it. But here we are now, and then we've got like 12 months. Um, and then the first payment is made. Um, it doesn't really matter what direction I draw it in, but I'm sure there's a standard. And it's something like that. And there's 120 of them in total. That's a picture of my annuity. Sweet. So um, if I have an amount of money in the future, and these are all like R for regular payments. So if I have an amount of money in the future, um, what it's amount worth now has to be discounted. That's right, isn't it? You discount the future to, to figure out what the present value is. Um, so $120, well, whatever, $10 next year is worth less than it is this year because the interest, the inflation's gone up and so I can't buy as much stuff for it. Okay, and so I know that this first payment here is going to have to be discounted by my interest rate, a monthly interest rate, but it's going to have to be discounted. So normally when you go into the future, you, when the money grows, you multiply by um, you multiply by this thing several times. It'll be whatever to the 12 if I was making it bigger. But I want to make it smaller, so I'm going to divide it by 12. So that's the first payment. And then the next payment is one month further into the future, so it's going to have to be divided by 13 because it's 13 months in the future. And the next payment is 14 months into the future and then so on until I get to the last payment which is 12 and 119 months into the future um, yep just checking just give me a second Yep, and so the last payment's like, there's 120 payments in all, um, which means the distance between the first payment and the last payment is actually 119 months, if that makes sense. There's 120 payments in total and the space between them, there's 120 edges, which means there's 119 gaps, and the gaps are the months. Yeah, I think that makes sense. So I get 119 plus 12, which is whatever that is. 120 plus 12 would be 132, um, something like that. Just to make sure the first payment has a 12, which would be 0, and the next payment has a 13, which would be, um, which would be 1, and the next payment has a 2, which would be 14, which would be 2 more than 12. And so the last payment, 120, they're all 1 less than they were. Payment 1 is... 12 plus 0, payment 2 is 12 plus 2, 1, payment 3 is 12 plus 3, so they're all one less, so the last one's 12 plus 119. Okay, not that that was necessary to do that to actually calculate the maths, but I just needed to feel better about it. So this is what the present value actually is. 
That's the present value, which your lecturer calls A. And there is some fancy maths formula that combines everything together to figure out um, what that turns out to be. So I'm going to show you something. I'm not going to show you the fancy maths, but I am going to um, do something useful. This has got a minus 12. This is minus 12 and another minus 1. This is minus 12 and another minus 2. And this is minus 12 and another minus 119. So they've all got a minus 12 in them. So I can pull the 1.07 over 12 to the minus 12 out the front of my maths. I've left with an R on its own, actually. Yep, yep, yep. Okay, it'll all work. I'm left with an R on its own and an R times with a minus one. Minus 119. You don't technically have to do any of this, but I do, um, for me, I can't remember the formula, so I'm going to have to do it this way. And it's an explanation as to why the formula works. This thing here would be what I would get if I had an annuity that started now. I've got a payment R now. I've got a payment R in one year's time, which is why the minus one month's time is minus minus one. I've got a payment R two years, two years, up to 119 months' time. So this is an annuity. I've forgotten which way, that, what it is, annuity due or annuity whatever. But this is an annuity that starts right now. Um, and so I should be able to use the formula for an annuity whatever um, to figure out what goes in that spot. First payment starts at the end of period 12, yep. I'm sorry, I can't remember the formula, so I'm just going to have to do a little bit of fiddling just to make sure I've got it right. Oh, I need that page. That page will be useful somewhere. So... Okay, what I'm going to do is to say, if you're listening on the video and you guys now, feel free to ignore this bit if it freaks you out. Um, but I just need to do it for, to make myself feel comfortable about this. See how all of these have an R? That means I can pull the R out the front, and then it's got this crappy bit at the front as well still. Um, and this number here, this is the sum of a geometric series. Now, if you did Intro Math Econ Basic over in the School of Economics, they would actually do it this way, rather than giving you a formula. So, yeah. Um, we'll have our thing at the front. And when you add up a whole lot of those things, what you get is... 1 minus to one higher power than it is at the moment. Like that. And this is where the formula comes from. And we multiply the top and the bottom So this was a minus 12 here, wasn't it? Okay, so if I multiply the top by that, by the positive version, that will make a minus 11. And
All right, cool. That's the derivation um, of the formula. So I have the formula now. So when I do that derivation, um, it eventually, when I do the maths, comes out to this. And you don't have to understand how to do this bit. It will come out to this. Okay, like that. So you'll notice the numbers that we had are in here. This is the 120 payments. This is not the 12 months that we waited. It's the 11th end of a month. Like it's the, sorry, it's the 11th beginning of... <coughs> no, there's an, there's, it's an, the, the first payment is at the end... Yeah, it's, it's 11. <laughs> So it says here just making sure that I've got this right. So if payments have been made have been deferred by k equals ten periods, then the first payment is made at the end of the eleventh period. So when I said that the first payment happens in exactly one year, um, that means that the first payment is at the end of the 12th period, which means that the K in my formula is here. So this ends up being what the formula is. So A equals R times 1 plus the per period interest rate. Okay, so that I there has already had the divided by 12 done. That's the per period interest rate. One minus one plus I to the minus N over I. That's the formula. And this is per period. So that means it's already had the, it had the divided by 12 done. And this is not the number of years, it's the number of periods, uh, number of payments. So as opposed to the number of years, it's not two years, it's 120 payments. Um, and this K is the number of um, the amount of periods until, well, it's one less than the amount of periods until the first payment. So that's what that is. So when you say that the payment's deferred for K periods, in an, in an ordinary annuity, the first payment's made at the end of the whatever period. So if you don't defer it at all, it's still one period until you get your first payment. Because in ordinary annuity, you have to wait a month because before you get your first payment. So um, this is the number number of periods to first payment minus one basically right so what that means is that means is in this example we get um, a equals R 1 plus 0 0.07 over 12 to the minus 11, 1 minus 1 plus 0 0.07 over 12 to the minus 120 over 0 0.07 over 12. And the A currently is 150,000. So I could put it as 150 and just do it in thousands when I figure it out. But, I mean, if I'm feeling, feeling like I can't cope with that, 
like that. And you'll see the thing is that, look, I don't have to do any fancy algebra. I just plug in my calculator and figure out what all of that crap is. And see what it comes out to. So, one plus... Mm -hmm. One plus... Um, one plus 0 0.07 divided by 12 all to the power of minus 11 times brackets 1 minus 1 plus 0 0.07 0 0.07 divided by 12 to the power of uh, minus 120 divided by 0 0.07 divided by 12. This is what I've typed into the computer here. You'll see I've had to have a whole lot of brackets to make everything um, line up into the right spot. Um, Excel is really nice. I wish you could have it in your exam um, because um, it colours in the brackets to say which one matches with which one. I wish calculators did that. I'm sure that the fancy CAS ones that have all of that, that can do calculus for you, do it, but you know, the other ones don't. But uh, that's that, and it comes out to that. So 80.7885. And so that means that I should divide both sides by that number to figure out what R is. So R is whatever it is. And 1856.70. Brilliant. Lovely. Um, so, ta-da. Not if all you wanted to do was figure out the present value, it'd be a little easier because you just plug the value of R in as well. So it looks like when you do your annuity stuff, you're actually going to have to have a whole lot of situations and the formulas that go with them um, because we can't all be... Um, we can't... Even me, who is, who is well practiced in the art of deriving the formula from scratch, would not want to do it every time when I had an exam. Um, so... Um, I would recommend having a formula. The formula is to look this bit, without that bit, it's the same as an annuity um, that has the same number of payments. Okay, so it was an annuity with 120 payments um, and that's the same formula for the present value of an annuity with 120 payments. The issue is, when do the payments start? And so you go, um, there's this bit that tells you when the payments start. So if the payments start right now, K is zero. I'm um, sorry, not right now. If the payments start in a month from now um, or a period from now, that means that K is zero because it's the number of times till the payment is one and anything to the zero is one. So it all comes out to the formula we normally have. So this bit here is the normal formula for a present value of an annuity. And if it's a deferred annuity, you put this extra bit in. But important that this K is actually one less than the number of periods it takes to get to the first payment. So if the first payment's in a year's time and it's paid monthly, that K will be 11. If the first payment's in two months' time and it's paid monthly, that K will be one. Um, and that's just the way it's done. And the terminology is if it says it's been deferred for three periods, <coughs> what they mean is the K is three and you'll actually be waiting for four months until the first payment actually happens because a traditional annuity that starts now, you still have to wait a month for the first payment anyway. There you go. I feel better about it. I, have, <laughs> I don't know how you feel, but it's been a long afternoon. But I must say that, um, that I'm glad that I now know that this terminology is one less than I thought it was going to be. Um, that's useful to know. Um, it's really useful when you put formulas on your cheat sheet. I always like to put arrows on them to say what things were, mean in my terminology. Um, because they're never going to ask you to just write down the formula. 
Um, so when I write this, I don't say it's the number of periods deferred. I say the periods till the first payment minus one so that I know what goes in that spot. Um, and I think that's a useful strategy when you do formulas. All right, well, that's quite enough. I really will stop now. <laughs>